Hello and welcome back to the Peak Endurance Podcast. My name is Isabel Ross and episode 162 is the second interview with Sean Bell. Sean is a runner for Run for Wishes and an ASICS Australia Sign Mind, Sign Body Ambassador. He is a 24-year-old from Melbourne, Victoria with an extraordinary passion for using his running to light up the lives of others. Sean believes his purpose is to inspire others to realise how precious life is so that they spend more time with the people they love and chase their dreams now because we are not promised tomorrow. And that is very true. Sean was planning originally a 14,000 kilometer run starting on Sunday, February 27th, 2022 to raise money and awareness for Make-A-Wish Australia. However, COVID put paid to that amongst many, many, many other things, of course. So Sean did what we've all had to learn to do and changed his plans. Instead, he thought he would do a test run for the big event. And that's how the idea for his run from Cairns to Melbourne was born. I almost made him go the reverse way, um, which he only just finished a couple of weeks ago. In this podcast, I chat with Sean and Steve, one of his support crew, and Steve helped me on my runs too. All about how the run went. Now you can help Sean raise money for the Make-A-Wish Foundation by going to his website, Sean Bell Run for Wishes, and the link is in the show notes, and we talk about it in the show, um, to donate. If you want to achieve the best you are capable of, check out my website to find out my, about my live event. I really can't talk. I will be presenting on how to develop your mental strength to get through those tough training blocks and those tough ultras. And they can be tough sometimes and require some extra mental strength. Go to peakendurancecoaching.com.au to register before it's too late because it's next week. You don't want to miss it. Enjoy the interview with Sean and Steve. Hello and welcome back to the podcast, Sean. Hey, hey, easy. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. No worries. And welcome for the first time, Stephen. Thanks, Is. Thanks for having us. Yeah, no worries. Now, um, first, uh, last time we spoke, Sean, was way back. I had a look, episode 61. So that's over 100 episodes ago. And back then, you were planning to run 14,000 kilometres starting on February the 27th of this year. And I remember it was meant to be 21, but you said, oh, I just can't be sure with COVID, we'll put it to 2022 just to be safe. Um, and, you know, of course, the COVID lockdowns wreaked havoc on many dreams and hopes and plans. <laughs> um, obviously, um, it affected you. Um, so um, what... How did it affect those plans that you had that that you were planning the 14,000 kilometres for the 27th of February? What happened there? Yeah, so I was planning to run around Australia for Make a Wish. The run was called Run for Wishes and I had to pivot, like, like you said, with COVID, like everyone did. We just realised that as that's such a huge project logistically, we weren't going to be able to make that possible in a short turnaround. And I was getting towy for an event. I was very excited to get running and to do something for charity, something big like this again. And so um, it became clear to me that when we weren't going to be able to run around Australia at that current time, when a 14,000 kilometer goal wasn't going to be possible just now, well, what else could we do? And so I came up with the idea of a campaign called 60 for 60 for 60. And what that means is 60 kilometers on average a day for 60 days for $60,000 to make a wish. And so what I realized is Cairns to Melbourne is just over 3,600 Ks, which is obviously that 60 kilometers a day by 60 days. So that's how the idea of Cairns to Melbourne came up. And yeah, I've just just got back two weeks ago, finished uh, in 60 days, this big run from Cairns to Melbourne. That is awesome. Congratulations. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, it was great fun and good to have Steve a part of it too. I was going to say, so Stephen, do you want to talk us through a little bit about what, what your role in that was? Yeah, of course is. So obviously with Sean's um, campaign going back several years, uh, Sean and I have known one another. Oh, I've tried to work it out, Belly. How old are you now, mate? At least 24. six or seven years, 24. Yeah. So, um, yeah, going back six or seven years, uh, obviously he played at Vermont uh, for his junior football where my son played and uh, happened to be down the local watering hole where he was pouring us a few beverages and uh, we got talking running. And um, at the same time, my brother was campaigning the idea of uh, doing something as ridiculous as around Australia. 
Um, so he started to flow ideas back and forth with myself and my brother. And um, from that, obviously, Sean's done several other runs. Um, the first one was his 24-hour run around Vermont footy ground. Then he did his 50 um, marathons in 50 days, um, which I was happy to be a local helper and just attending uh, different courses. And then when it came to the crunch for the uh, Cairns to Melbourne run, um, without hesitation is, uh, you know what I'm like, I uh, put, <laughs> my hand up to, put my hand up to uh, be a support crew worker with Shawnee. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't give him the Sydney to Melbourne leg, but from Marimbula to Melbourne was uh, the last two weeks, which was super fun, Shawnee. And we had all the weather thrown, thrown at us too, mate. We sure did. Yeah, well, we'll get to that in a, in a minute. So um, you say it was um, approximately 60 kilometres a day. So that was basically the average you hit? Or we, was I correct? In, I think Stephen said sometimes you were doing more. Yes, we were doing more. Um, originally, as I said, we set out with that. So the goal was 60, 60, 60. And uh, in the end, I averaged 66 Ks a day. It's sort of how my brain works. I can't really sit still. And I guess as like a lot of ultra runners, I love running to feel. So when you feel good, keep going. And so yeah. the, biggest, the biggest day that we had out there was actually day 31 which was 85 kilometers and the smallest day we had was 57 kilometers so there was uh, a few days in the 50s majority in the high 60s some in the 70s and, and then a few in the 80s as well so for me that's just how it works and how it works best and it worked out that we were only 240 kilometers from Melbourne with seven days to go and I realized okay, we could get back and achieve the goal and we could do 35 Ks a day here for the last week, but that's not what I wanted to set out to, to do. At the end of the day, also, one of my highest values is striving to be the best that I can. So I thought, I oh, know we've got to change the goal. What's something else that we could do to keep us on track? And I realized that we hit 2,000 kilometers on day 30, 3,000 kilometers on day 45. I thought we could hit 4,000 Ks in 60 days if we just change the route a little bit towards the end. <laughs> oh my God, such an ultra runner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fine. I did not realize that. There you go. Wow. So it ended up being four thousand Ks. Yeah. So I was relying on Steve to throw a bit of a different route together uh, <laughs> to be able to support me because I was just obviously naturally very fatigued running that those sorts of distances. No day every day and for me I just wanted to focus on as much as I could my running and rest and and eating and get to bed if I wasn't doing that so uh the crew were really really good with being able to help with navigation and and then from there I could just follow them so most of the time it was pretty straightforward we'd be running on the A1 the majority of the nice. time from Cairns to Melbourne but when you start to add in especially when you're going through say Brisbane City or Sydney City there's a lot of turns where we have to stay off the road so you're on bike paths and that sort of thing to have the support of the crew and then when Steve was there from Marimbula through to Melbourne well we ended up going out to Cranbourne South and from Cranbourne South to Mornington oh my Mornington god back into the MCG and and then, um, and then back out to Vermont from there. So we finished the final day, day 60, with the community at Ringwood Athletics Track, which was awesome to have people running wow. by the side. That would have been brilliant. So what was your average um, kilometres per day then for that last for the last week? Yeah, I think it, was, it had to work out to be 67 k's a day. Okay. So it was really averaging around what yep. we've done the whole trip. So that's that was the other reason for me. I sort of thought, well, nothing's really changing. Like we're still yep. doing what we've been doing. Let's just go one more week. So the last week was pretty challenging because I was physically pretty run down at that point. And I think it was just coming into Victoria and it being so much colder than what we've been used to and the big days. And uh, all of a sudden it was showing up in my body. But we, I knew that we could push on because there was just a few days to go and then give my body the rest that we needed to. Yeah. Did you have any rest days? Uh, I had two rest days, which weren't planned rest days. So day seven of my run, I actually got the news that my coach passed away during the challenge. So that was, when I say rest days, it was flying to Sydney for his memorial oh, wow. and, then, and then flying back to Ballina to be able to run again. So there was, I guess, physically a rest. So I, I did run those two days just to keep moving. So I didn't yeah, see yeah. that, but very, imagine. very small runs. And yeah, emotionally was, I had to go, had to go to that and then come back and get going. Yeah, so a rest day for the 
body but not really for the soul yeah yeah definitely yeah i understand and um Stephen, what's your role other than root creation um <laughs> with keeping sean on the road well yeah there's a there's a bit of uh, logistical fun with uh, that is because obviously as sean mentioned that uh, the four thousand challenge was up for takings and there wasn't too much more to go when we <laughs> were out running through lakes entrance shawnee you'll remember <laughs> this <laughs> you're on a phone call to i can't remember it may have been dj and um yes you're heading west in a western direction <laughs> for another 30 k's but you kept saying we're going south and <laughs> i think dj said if you go 30 k's south you're going to be in bass straight somewhere mate <laughs> <laughs> It'll turn into a swim. <laughs> yeah, so we're trying to get Shawnee's navigation in, in <laughs> focus. Um, but then there'd be, um, and as a support crew, I think this is one of the um, pivotal points when you sign up for something like this. You have to have the athlete at the purest um, level of focus. So when Sean gets up of a, a morning, he doesn't need to think about what he's put in his cereal bowl. It was, this is what Sean has for breakfast, just make it, put in put under his nose and, and tell him that he's got to start his day because uh, the boy didn't mind staying under the doona um, <laughs> for a few extra minutes if he could sneak it. And then the days where he was really struggling, yeah, you just have to take him by the scruff of the neck and say, mate, <laughs> what was our saying, Shawnee? These guys aren't going to bank themselves. So uh, that was the catch cry for a lot of the support crew uh, through the journey. Um, and then obviously um, of a morning, we'd start most mornings sort of seven-ish depending on the daylight um, from where obviously Victoria were, were pretty limited to starting any earlier than quarter past seven thereabouts. But, um, you know, you get him a coffee three k's down the road so he can take maybe his jacket off and we'll assess if it's too cold to take the jacket off and make sure he's got his gloves and um, just checking in at every um, sort of time frame. It was generally seven k's to 10 k's once Sean got his, his rhythm going. But, you know, if there was a, a good spell in the middle of the day, where he wanted to stretch out or we're chasing daylight, you know, it could go 12 to 15 k's. And particularly when there are certain sections where uh, the motor vehicle just couldn't access um, sections through paddocks, um, particularly through East Gippsland, um, the boys could have been out there for two hours, more or less. So just making sure that they had ad adequate food and, and water at every given chance. And then, um, you know, at the, the end, day's end, it was always about making sure uh, had his accommodation settled. Um, there was a couple of special treats towards the end there, wasn't there, Shawnee, with a, a motel with a, an ensuite that had a spa bar. So I oh, ran the wow. spa for him. And uh, he came in came in straight into the spa with a, a big, large garlic pizza. And uh, oh, he, he's, he's, he's super drink, which I don't know, Shawnee, can we share with the audience uh, what entailed in the super, super yeah. juice? Go for it. <laughs> So um, you may have noticed through uh, the Run for Wishes pages that there was a, a considerable amount of uh, donuts consumed. He generally didn't eat the donuts. Uh, either Maxie or myself or someone else on the crew early in the piece would get, I think it was four cinnamon donuts, two chocolate muffins, uh, a, a big chocolate ice milk, and then a big ladle of honey or peanut butter and just about anything that was calorie rich to throw into the blender. And uh, on the nutritional advice of his dietitian, he had to smash like six, 7,000 calories through his, uh, his uh, what we call it, a milkshake or a, a slurpee of, of calories. I don't know <laughs> what to call it, but it was it was big. And more often than not, he'd, he'd try and drink that uh, before he'd go to bed. Obviously, you get the Did nutrition. Did it taste all right, uh, Sean? Oh, it didn't really. Is It sort of tasted like a cake mix. You're making a big yeah. cake and you're getting stuck halfway. Oh. But it was it was very important. I think it was sort of 2,500 calories per drink. And when, you, yeah. when you're burning six or 7,000 calories, you know, just, just running alone, yeah. then you've got all your metabolic calories as well. It's obviously, um, yeah, it's, it's important. So I was pretty good throughout the run. I didn't lose too much weight. I lost four kilos. And when you consider what I was doing. That's not pretty, much. Yeah. yeah, it was pretty good. So those sorts of things were, were really um, what we needed to do. And I actually lost four kilos in the first 10 days in Cairns. So um, it was in the heat and sweating out yeah. so much and not quite understanding the equation of how much I truly need to eat. We had a real priority of eating well. And then we had to realize, okay, it's a mix of eating well and just getting calories in here. So 
I, I think it's at that point where it's not so much about the healthy food. It's the, it, yeah, it's just the calorie yeah. density of the food. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So then we had to really change that and understand that. And when we did that, we, we, we tended, we tended to be okay. So yeah. Um, yeah. So no, it was good. And, and uh, I think at that point, Steve's help was, was massive for me because I said my body had got run down towards Victoria towards the end. And, and I knew that, okay, we still needed close to 70 Ks a day here. Let's, do what it takes, but I'm going to need that extra support. And there's no real exaggeration what he was talking about. I remember one day, day 58, running from Mornington and finishing at the MCG. Um, and he's like, what time are you getting up? I said, six o'clock. And my alarm went off at six and at 6.01, there's the door open. There's the, there's your juice, there's your cereal. And I was like, oh, how good is this? Could get used to this. <laughs> how's, do- how's mum doing it for you these days, Sean? <laughs> yeah, not, not quite the same. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So, yeah, so it was very um, routine driven and I guess you have to be to ensure that you get through it. Um, and, and did any niggles come up in the body or anything like that? Early on in the run, I had some issues, I guess, adapting to the load. And that's because one of the things that Jace, my coach, is, is very – big on is strength as opposed to kilometers so he's not massive on volume my my typical week is really 60 to 80 kilometer weeks wow. and um and sometimes i might push 100 but it's it's rare that i even get up there on my normal week it, and it's all about intensity so i'll do a lot of hill sprints a lot of intervals a lot of tempo runs um and so going into the run like that yeah i was physically strong but when you when you're talking about going from 80 kilometers a week to the very first week jumping up and running 430 it just took the body a bit of time to get used to the load increase and so for the first two or three weeks i was having some issues with my calves and that was just purely some niggles that would settle with some rock tape and, and focusing on that particular area and after that two to three weeks didn't really have any injuries at all so so, you know, I spoke about my coach and how he passed during the challenge and people talk about the run and how it's so big. How did you not really have injuries? But I think the biggest adversity I dealt with through the run was the grief of losing him, but it's also an incredible testament to the person that he is. And he, he got me in the position to be able to do this. And, mm. and I'm so glad that I was able to pull it off for him. Yeah, that's, it's, a, it's a, bra- a great memorial for him, that run as well, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so no, that's awesome. Um, and in, in saying that with the niggles, then how many pairs of shoes did you go through? Went through seven pairs in the end. Um, yeah, there were it was interesting. We had to have six pairs of size 14s and one pair of 13s. So I'm normally a 13. Ah. This is something I think a lot of ultra runners don't consider because normally, you know, a lot of ultra runners, you might go out for a 50k 100k 100 mile but it's the one race Uh, when it's when it's back to back like this I definitely didn't consider it and your feet get so swollen that my feet got longer and wider so you had to quickly jump into the 14s yeah 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 no I I can I can imagine that what shoes were you running in Asics glide rides were my my favorite so yeah they're a really supportive long distance shoe on the road that is they're really good they've got that forward rocker and for Uh me that's important because under fatigue you don't want to heel strike you want to keep your form obviously as efficient as possible so that was really supportive for me so you were saying you took the a1 so do you want to just for people who don't know that just sort of describe a little bit of what the route was yeah, so we started in Cairns and we're pretty much running on the national highway. So the A1 is just the, the main highway that runs from um, Cairns. Really, we pretty much followed that all the way through to um, a town called Gympie. And so that yep. was the Bruce, that's the Bruce Highway. Um, and then from there, we had to take the old Bruce Highway because it becomes the M1, which is sort of like for people in Victoria listening, it's sort of like the Monash. You, you can't run on the Monash. So yeah. um, we had to take some back roads from that point, which made it pretty tricky because going into Brisbane from the Sunshine Coast, we had to run through the Glasshouse Mountains. So absolutely gorgeous, but way inland, very hot. Yeah. It was like a furnace in there and just a different challenge. So, um, and that was that was how we navigated our way into Brisbane. It was pretty frustrating for me because I, I would see signs that would say 75 Ks to Brisbane, but of course that's the most direct way in the car. And 125, yeah. 125 Ks later, we made it to Brisbane running. Oh, no. <laughs> so that, that played with my mind a little bit out there, especially given the heat and doing it day after day. 
Um, but then as we got through to um, New South Wales, again, it was mostly um, along the Pacific Highway. So again, that becomes the A1, the National Highway. And then from there down towards Sydney, navigating through a lot of the side streets and a lot of like bike paths, it was really well laid out. We just used uh, Ride with GPS, that, um, oh, GPS yeah. which worked really well. And then from there on the Princess Highway A1 and, and followed that all the way to the Victorian border and then all, pretty much all the way home. Nice. Makes it sound so easy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Stephen, did you, uh, from what I remember when we chatted the other day, you said you rode with Sean a little bit as well? Yeah, that's right. It is So part of the support crew, um, Sean, more often than not, he'd start the morning uh, potentially by himself. There was a couple of days where the weather was so bad that I just had to get myself out of that level of comfort and get on the bike. Um, clearly, the roads aren't always in the uh, peak condition to have a cyclist and a runner. Yeah. Um, following the shoulder. So uh, for Sean's safety, we'd have a, a either a runner or someone on the bike um, in a high-vis vest um, just to comply with the, the laws of the uh, the highway um, and to keep Sean uh, mind at bay, more or less. Uh, you can distract him, have a conversation, uh, throw up a, a few, few jokes or just do some silly things to prank him and stuff like that. So... Yeah, part of the support work was to make sure that he um, just felt comfortable and that he, he wasn't doing it on his own, but he was yeah. in a lot of um, the instance in that regards. So, um, yeah, and, you know, he, he, on the Victorian stretch, he was fortunate enough to have a couple of mates that, you know, took the time out of work just to drive up for a day or two. So there's at times four or five of us, which oh, two, wow. two, could, two could be out there running, one would be in the bus and, the other one could be driving a mate's vehicle down the road. And um, that worked really well. It's sort of, the, sort of the first week when I joined him, which was the second last week, it sort of became a blur because there was so much interaction with different people all the time that it wasn't left to Max or myself at any given time. So uh, Max could get out and have a run. And uh, how many workouts do you reckon he did one day, Shawnee? I reckon he probably put out four or five yeah. uh, body-weighted exercises and ab exercises. <laughs> is a machine. <laughs> yeah the level of support from crew was was unbelievable is i think um you know smithy touched on my friend max there so max gave up two months of his life to oh, wow. um, be the project manager as such of the run so that meant that i could then focus on my role of, of being predominantly the, the runner and and when i'm not running i'm eating or i'm, I'm resting as much as possible and that way Max could then coordinate the other volunteers that came. And so we had family, we had friends and people would give up whatever they could, whether it was, I think the smallest was five days through to a week, through to two weeks in, in Smithy's case. So yeah, I had some great support. And overall in the end, it was myself, Max and 16 others. Wow. That's awesome. And, and it really, um, is a testament to the community of, of ultra runners is how people are happy to help out. Oh, absolutely. I think this doesn't happen without those people. And mm. you know, everyone sees the runner at the front, but I, I've made sure every opportunity I can to credit crew because yeah, it doesn't happen without them. And it just, it's all, it's in all the little things. It's what I spoke about of Steve coming, handing me my cereal first thing in the morning, because you, yeah your body and mind are sore. You don't want to go again, but that's just one less decision and one less thing to think about. So one less decision to make when you get up and you don't even have to think about it. You just eat, you get on with it. And all of a sudden you've got your shoes on and you're running and it's just another day. And sometimes you have to be a father figure to Sean because yeah. when, when we were only three or four days out and uh, I could, I could sense the excitement in him because he's a young lad and, what do young lads do is when they, they catch up with their mates, they start to make poor decisions for themselves. So <laughs> this, particular, this particular afternoon, it was mid, uh, I reckon about four o'clock, and we're at Mornington um, bath, bath Houses, and uh, the crew decided that it'd be great to go for a swim after having done 30-odd Ks, and it was about eight degrees. And I'm oh, looking gosh. at you and going, mate, you've had a week of a croaky throat. You've got 72 <laughs> hours ahead of you please consider what you're about to do. And to his credit, he only went up to his ankles. 
And yeah. Um, yeah, where the others were out there swimming for five oh, or so minutes. Oh, that sounds horrible so. swimming in that weather. <laughs> <laughs> well, Shawnee, you can actually answer this tru- truthfully. The weekend when we were in all Boston, I think it was Ren's second last night with us on the Thursday night. What did what was the challenge he put forward to you? Yeah, well, this is it's pretty funny, this one. So basically, Max and Ren, they're guys around my age. So to paint the picture for the audience, guys around 25, 26, who, you know, there's a lot of ego with young, young <laughs> boys, young men like that coming together. And obviously, I'm out there running these massive dif- distances every single day. And so they would say to me every single day that they're, they've got a stronger mind than me. And I said, yeah, right. I'm running for eight hours or, or so you're running for an hour. My mind's way stronger. They're like, no. Nah. <laughs> so then they would just run with no shirt on, no matter what. It was three degrees. I'm, oh. I'm out there in a puffer jacket, beanie gloves, and they're running with no shirt on just to prove a point. And then, <laughs> and then they'd cold water shower only. So they'd, oh, no. so they'd only have cold showers. And I'm like, yeah, you can, you can finish cold, but you got to start hot in the morning. Surely, come on! And they're like, no, nah, cold only, and they were doing it just to just to get to my mind, and it actually did. They sort of started chipping away at it, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to prove to you guys that all right, I am stronger minded. I'll do this. So, just cold showers only. Start oh running, no! Start, start running in just a t-shirt first thing in the morning, and of course, my immune system's run down. I start to get pretty sick, so they thought it was pretty funny, um, and I did. I did too looking back but uh yeah i think a little bit of male ego coming together and a bit of competition but do you think that kind of that banter and that being a bit silly sort of helps helps it helps you get through it all it does for sure because the biggest thing is you know otherwise like i'm i I love what i'm doing and i'm incredibly grateful to be out there it's a dream that i've now realized and all of that but at the same point it is repetitive. Every single day is very routine. And so that's why when you have different crew, and that's what we love so much about a rolling support crew is different crew bring energy. And it doesn't yeah. matter who they are. It's just seeing new faces. And it, it, cha- it gives a big change to the day to the day to day. So uh, and one of the things that's one of the things that Steve and Rin were very big on, they wanted to make sure that there was big energy all the time. So whether it was through loud music or banter or getting in my face like that or whatever it may be uh it just made it yeah a really fun experience well i was going to say sean i'm glad they came to the back end of the, the party some of the energy that bloody ren had he'd be yeah. dancing we had we had techno going from 6 a.m in the morning till <laughs> bedtime some days and it was like we're out in the bush peace and quiet and we've got the van pumping tunes <laughs> left right and center i'm thinking shawnee please you know, conserve your energy, mate. Don't get yeah. caught up. And, and that's the thing, having known what he's already achieved and what he's gone through, there's still light at the end of the tunnel. So part of, you know, being the older statesman in the group at the time, just managing his energy was sometimes where I just had to check in with him in that yeah. regards. But, yeah, yeah you did, right? The, the, it was so much fun when they were on board. Well, it certainly sounds like a lot of fun, but um, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think more towards the end of it is probably better than at the start. You wouldn't want to have burned out early. Um, what sort of pace were you running at? Pretty slow is so generally anywhere from six to seven minutes a K. Most mm-hmm. of the time around 6.30. I'd say I haven't actually worked out what it, what it would be across the board from a day to day, but most of the time around 6.30, I'd say. Um, which is yeah. actually I mean I know you say it's slow but it's actually when you consider how much you're backing up every single day that's 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 really good yeah there was days towards the end there where I think there was a couple of days in a row where I ran about uh, I got in the the one that Smithy spoke about before where he said that he had the garlic pizza in a spa bath and gave it to me and I was like oh my god like I literally push myself today as much as I can and my watch is telling me seven minutes 14 per kilometer oh, so wow. that was a long slow day a big yeah. tough one um and yeah you have some quicker days you have some slower days but overall it was around that mark it was I remember the day that I felt the best physically was day 23 I was near a town called Gympie in yeah. Queensland um and I averaged 559 per k for 77 kilometers that oh day. wow that's um, awesome. So yeah, I felt really good, but uh, I had a text from DJ, my business partner, who's also one of my coaches. And he, he said, Hey mate, I'm talking for me here and know exactly what Jace would say. You've got to pull the pace back a little bit. You've got 37 days to go. Yeah. 
Um, you know, I've looked at your strive, you keep getting that little bit quicker. And if you keep going too quick, to see injury risk is obviously yeah. right up there with considering the loads. So that was really good to be able to see that and just go, okay, take a step back a little bit and understand that there's, there's a bigger thing at play here. We've got to make it all the way home. Yeah, you got to look at the, the the whole, the big picture, don't you, rather than just how you're feeling in the moment. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. And so um, with that running and, you know, um, like starting each morning, what was that like, like starting again? How did the body feel? Like, I just can't even imagine. I struggled a lot in the morning is that was that was really interesting for me because normally outside of when you're doing a campaign like this, I'm a morning person yeah. um, with energy in the morning. And so I found that really hard to be a zombie in the morning. And yeah. I really was, it was, I think you, you're so fatigued that no matter how much sleep you get, even if you and your crew do a great job of making sure that I get eight to nine hours sleep, uh, I still woke up fatigued. And that's yeah. just because you it, accumulatively you're running so much and you're so tired. So that was tough. And I think that's why we had to try and streamline those things in the morning as much as possible. And it was just trying to create this system so that I could get out the door and get going because once you're into it, it's, it's just another day. And the yes. first 10 Ks or so were always the hardest. And so that's why Steve spoke about before. Sometimes I would have crew with me, but a lot of the time I just chuck some music in pretty loud and just say, all right, let's just get, get to about the 10 kilometer mark. And then eventually I'll start to come good. And some days you never do, but it is always just breaking it down and understanding that you're going to feel terrible at the start, but remind yourself that eventually it will get a little bit easier and, and it does. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much every run for me lately, but, um, <laughs> um, and um, what about nutrition? Like, I know you had those big calorie bomb thingies at the end, but what about while you were running? What sort of stuff did you eat? And did you get gastric distress or how did that all work out? Generally not. Generally I was okay, which was, which was really good. I think I worked closely with my dietitian Chloe McLeod, and that was because, you know, I don't, don't use a dietitian on my day-to-day -day life, but during something like this, you can't really get it wrong. As we spoke yeah. about it, I lost so much weight in the first 10 days that, okay, we had to make some changes. So one of the things that Chloe was big on was a big breakfast, medium lunch, not too big so that you can keep running after it. And then a big dinner. Yeah. Um, and so I struggled to have a big breakfast in the morning because I felt so run down in the morning. I probably couldn't manage anything more than five wheat bix and, and a drink of juice. So that was the extent of my breakfast. And so we tried to eat every eight kilometers or so, I want to say every, every hour. Um, and so if I ate every hour, then that way I could manage it. I'm not going to drop too much energy. It was just trying to have something every hour. So there was a day where I actually recorded everything that I ate and showed people. And, and one of the things that I would have every hour, for example, it might've been the first hour of banana and a Gatorade. The next hour might've been a handful of dates and a big donut. Um, the next hour might've been a cliff bar and a handful of nuts. So just by doing that and constantly getting some food in and then a sort of medium, medium um, pasta or something like that for lunch always, always helps. And then, um, yeah, really big dinner. And then it was trying to get it in through fluid other than that. And so you started at about seven each day. Well, it really depended on where we were. So when we were in Cairns from the beginning of the run, it was really hot. And so we, we had to start at about six, six 15 in the morning. And there's no exaggeration when I say this from, it gets light at six o'clock, but from six till seven, it's about 21 degrees. And from 7 a.m. onwards, it's 28 and 29, 30. Oh, so yeah. that, that first hour, you've got to get kilometers in. Yeah. And mentally, if you don't, it is tough. And yeah. I remember one of those days early, I was really struggling to get going in the morning and I didn't start running till about 10 to eight. Now, if that was the same, if that was down in Victoria, that wouldn't be so bad because we yeah. had those kilometers in the bank. It was cooler. Um, it was dark in the morning. So we were able to do that, but in, in Cairns, we just needed to be out there early. So it really depended on where I was. I'd say when I was in Queensland, I'd start around six. And then when I was in New South Wales, Victoria, I tend to start around seven. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's amazing, you know, like basically you're in one country um, and yet such a diverse range of weathers. 
yeah so true i think it's it was very special to see all of it really mm. you know I, i'd never been as far as the furthest i'd been in queensland was sunshine coast and mm. and it's actually a funny story because i was naive i didn't do enough research i'm just the runner i think and probably didn't plan it as as best i should just mentally because i didn't realize how far Cairns is to brisbane and oh. <laughs> Cairns to brisbane it's a long way you know else that doesn't know is as far as brisbane to melbourne so yes. it is huge <laughs> and uh <laughs> I just hadn't hadn't mentally prepared for that. And so I remember I was about two weeks in, I don't know, 800, 900 kilometers in, and it was day 14 or 15, something like that. And I saw my very first sign to Brisbane, 900 kilometers. And I just <laughs> felt like, oh my God, is this, are we ever going to get there? <laughs> I bet. Did you, did you get that feeling sometimes? Like, is this ever going to end? Is it like a little bit, was it a bit like that sometimes? Definitely, definitely. And there's days that you feel really good and there's days that you feel terrible. So I really had to control my mind. And on the days where I really struggled and I felt like that, I had to really dial it back. And honestly, it sounds cliche, but think about it one step at a time because I was so exhausted. That was the only way that I could manage it. Whereas the days where I was feeling better, I could think about, okay, let's just get to the next 10 kilometers and the next 10 kilometers. And you're still breaking it down. You're still only thinking about that particular day, but you are in a better place mentally. So depending on how I was feeling each day, that sort of depended on how small I looked at it and how much I broke it down. Now, um, 4,000 kilometres, how do you feel now about 14,000? <laughs> it's a good question, that one. Uh, I still feel excited. I, I definitely do. I feel it's been two weeks and uh, it's funny, day 60 at the athletics tracks, I spoke about how we got home, well, we got to Melbourne on day 56 or metropolitan Melbourne, the outskirts, which was Cranbourne South. So we ended up running around to Hastings and Mornington, out to Richmond, back to where I live in Vermont, Eastern suburbs. And then on the last day, I had a day with the community. And I remember running the final day was 69 Ks and we hit the 4,000. I gave my friend Zach a hug and Zach's been instrumental in the Run for Wishes project. A lot of stuff that people don't see is all the all the logistics from an insurance point of view, permits, route building, that sort of stuff. So Zach was able to help me with all of that. And I gave him a hug and said, mate, thanks so much for being a part of this, a big part of part A. And he just shook his head. He's like, what are you talking about? Part a? <laughs> can't be, you can't be thinking about part B already. And I said, I don't know. I'm an ultra runner, mate. It's where my brain goes. Yeah. I said, um, there will be a part B. I've, I've still got the dream of running around Australia. So that's really exciting. I don't know when that'll be. And there's a lot that, you know, needs to unfold before that. Uh, but I'm really excited for when that day does arrive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so did you raise the 60,000? Yes. And I'm very proud to say just today before, literally just before we jumped on for this call, uh, we've hit $100,000. So wow, absolutely smashed it. And it's, it's really exciting. It was day 53 end of day 53 with a week to go that was when i went on social media and said okay we're only 240 kilometers out from melbourne in an effort to raise more money for make a wish and to inspire others to chase their own dreams i'm going to raise the bar let's change the goal to 4000 kilometers everyone's like oh he's going to 4000 now not 3700 all right let's jump on and it just seemed oh, like from that brilliant. point it seemed yeah. like from that point the donations just went nuts and it was so special so we got to uh, by the end of day 57, we'd raised our 60K. And by the end of day 60, we were at about 85,000. And then just today, two weeks post the run, we've hit $100,000. So to smash that fundraising goal is very special. Congratulations. That's brilliant. Uh, thank and, you. And what, how, how does that help the Make-A-Wish Foundation? Yeah. So for anyone who's not familiar with the work that Make-A-Wish do, they help critically ill children achieve their number one wish. So the child's wish might be to ha have a puppy. It might be to run with their favorite AFL team. It might be to go on a family holiday to America. Every child's wish is unique. And so what Make-A-Wish do is they help with an entire wish journey. So they help this child unpack what they want and then they help this child whilst they're going through a really tough time. And that might be cancer. It might be a heart condition. It might be a blood condition to focus on something really positive. So for them, it's their wish and whatever it may be being actually realized. And so 
uh, if let's say, for example, their wish is to go to America, to go to Disneyland. Well, at the start, it might be actually just showing them photos and really planting that seed in their mind. This is the anticipation phase of what's going to yeah. come for you. So it's a real journey for them. And that's why I love the work that they do, because it really does bring hope and happiness to these children and their families. And I think for me, it all comes back to when I was 18 myself and he wasn't a wish child, but one of my friends completely healthy playing football for the Vermont Eagles passed away in his sleep. And that crushed me. It taught me how precious life is. And if you can go to bed and not wake up, then we must chase our dreams. So for me, it all comes down to the fact that I wanted to do something. I wanted to chase my own dream of running from Cairns to Melbourne in order to help these children achieve theirs. And so to, to raise a hundred K now, a lot more children will be able to make that wish come true. Yeah, no, I can imagine it would. So that's awesome. Well done. And can, can people still donate? People listening? Yeah, people can. Yeah, for sure. So if people want to head to runforwishes.com.au, they can jump on there and that's they can read more about the run and how it all sort of unfolded and, and donate to make a wish there. Yeah, well, I'll put that in the show notes as well so um, that, that people can also click that link if they... Um, have forgotten by the time they get home if they're listening to this on the run or something. Um, so, um, Stephen, do you have any more sort of funny stories from from the trip or anything you want to share with us? Maybe to do with his nickname that you came up with? Uh, yeah. So there was an incident with Maxie. I wasn't part of the crew at this point, and um, it was something to do with the accommodation arrangement where it was a communal living arrangement. Uh, but the public toilets or the facilities weren't quite in the living space of where Sean's bed was. Um, so, Sinky, over to you, mate, to explain to the uh, listeners. Oh, as to I think how, I'm starting to work it out. Uh, as to how <laughs> this ca- nickname came about from Maxwell. I don't really want to uh, go into it, but I'm happy to just because you've thrown me <laughs> under the bus. So, yeah, basically to the ultra runners and <laughs> runners listening to this, if you've run 68 kilometres that day and many kilometres for previous days, you're pretty tired. There should have been a toilet in our room in the motel where we were. There wasn't. There wasn't one. I can't no. believe there wasn't a toilet in the room. I know. And there wasn't like, one. It was probably... It was probably 60 70 meters away it was a fair walk genuinely and it's in the middle Max says it's only 20 meters uh max is putting mayo on it so anyway (laughs) i was like no i'm just there's a sink here i just need a wee and i'm going back to bed so anyway (laughs) trip the rest of the trip the crew were calling me sinky and uh yeah it was a bit of banter that's not what I expected but, uh, from that nickname. So I'm sorry for bringing that up, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that, was, uh, that was the catch cry for um, Belly and um, Maxi. And then obviously Maxi was always the, the, the key person to do something a little bit outlandish on most days. Um, how many push-ups do you reckon you end up doing, Shawnee? Don't know, but yeah, one of the things, obviously the the big sacrifice for Max, he loves his fitness just like all of us and he couldn't couldn't be going to the gym like he would want to be doing back home. So he had to keep his fitness up as well, which was possible when we were in places like New South Wales and Victoria because one of the things that people listening wouldn't quite understand is every state had different rules. So Queensland meant that they had to trail me the whole time. Imagine driving at eight to nine kilometers an hour in a motorhome for eight to nine, 10 hours a day. So huge days and incredibly tough for the crew. Whereas when we're in New South Wales and Victoria, they were allowed to leapfrog me. So I could see them every hour. I could just say, all right, cheers guys. I've got what I need. We'll catch you later. And so that way they could drive ahead. He could be doing his push-ups on the side of the road. I reckon there were days where he pumped out 500 push-ups. Just to oh, wow. Down. Yeah. So for him, it and was- And workout and- yeah single leg from um, deadlifts and god knows everything else yeah so no he was it was great in in uh yeah keeping fit throughout as much as he could as well yeah I, I never really thought about it but i guess otherwise the crew is for a very long time just stuck in the car and and can't really do much at all can they that's it yeah uh, when he 
when we sort of reflected after the run, he's like, would you support crew? I'm like, oh, geez, I don't know. It's a, it's a tough gig, isn't it? I, I said, it's obvious, obviously depends who's doing it, how long they're doing it for, yeah. where they're doing it. Like if Max decided to do something, 100%, I feel like I have to yes. give back to him. Yes. Um, but it, it really depends. Like it is a massive sacrifice, again, that people don't see. So uh, it's something that I'm, I'm forever grateful for because it doesn't happen without them. That's right. And I think it does take a special kind of person to be able to crew because um, it's it's patience and it's all the logistics. And yeah, I agree with you, Sean. I don't know if I could, you know, be as good as some people are at crewing. So yeah. yeah. How, good, how, how good were the pancakes, Shawnee, on the side of the road? <laughs> Depends a, certain who, chef, a certain chef was very good at it. And I then, was going to say, it depends who was making them. Yeah, no, <laughs> was a couple of days towards the end, I was like, oh, I would love some pancakes if you guys can knock them up within so that once I'd see them an hour later, they were ready. And the first day, Steve just made these brilliant pancakes. And the next day, Rin made it and it looked genuinely like damper, like when oh, you were no. in school. It was like I was eating Play-Doh. So it was completely <laughs> different. Uh, there's obviously an art <laughs> all right well, not so much water yeah thank you so much to both of you for um joining me today to talk about your adventure um and and i really do hope you get to do the run around australia if if you do not locking you in or anything but when do you think you might Oh, that's a good question because i i, I genuinely don't know at this point yeah. in time i think it's such a big thing not from just a physical and mental point of view but logistics the, yeah. the biggest thing that over the last three years is all of the prep that goes into something like this is it pulls you away from your work so you're constantly I'm constantly on the phone to police officers in different states or um, Vic roads New South Wales roads Queensland roads I feel like if we're going to be able to do it soon, I'm going to need a team of people to help me with that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, it'll, it'll be within the next few years sometime. Yeah. Yeah. Shawnee, can I, can I leak a little bit more information? So <laughs> Shawnee's off to Queensland in what, two weeks time? Yeah, pretty much. So big move for me. I've, I've always wanted to uh, have a bit of a different lifestyle and, and yeah. like every every runner, live by the beach. So um, for me, I've got three months lined up in Kurumba and one of my mates has gone on a three-month holiday and I'm going to jump into his place and sublet. Oh, nice. So uh, it, uh, but when, when, you're this... Kurumba, sorry, is, when you're in Kurumba, Shawnee, are you catching up with anyone in particular that might hold the Australian Around Australia record by mm. chance? Oh, there's a there's a guy, he's a good friend of mine, um, Dave Valley, who's yeah, been. Yeah, yeah, I've interviewed him. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. After chatting with you. Yeah, he's a ripper, Dave. He's a, he's a yeah. genuinely great human being and holds the record of running around Australia as well as riding around Australia. Yes. Uh, we'll we'll hang out more up on the Gold Coast and and chat more about the run. I think he's he was very excited to support me, which was you know just shows the person that he is. I think you know he knows that I'm potentially looking at running around Australia, and he's still so giving of his time and advice and happy to help. So we'll have the conversations up there and see what comes out of it. So I genuinely don't know what time, when it will be, but one thing I can assure you is, is the fire is still in the belly to go again. And I'm sure talking with Dave will really motivate you as well. Um, you Definitely. Know. Yeah, no, he's yeah. a great man. 18 yeah. months time, 18 months, two years. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> well, um, I request an interview for after. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thank you both so much for coming on today. Thanks, Iz. Thanks, Iz. Okay, bye.